And as Josh alluded to, uh, Chris Ricks will be giving us a brief overview or a brief review of oculocutaneous albinism. He is from UT Medical School in Houston, so welcome him. My name is Christopher Ricks. Uh, glad to be here. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm going to talk a little bit about oculocutaneous albinism. So when we think about albinism, uh, several images might come to mind. Uh, maybe something like this. Maybe this. Maybe something a little more tragic like this. This is an article from National Geographic about the alarming number of albinos that are killed in places like Tanzania because people don't understand what they are and have false beliefs about magical powers that they might contain. So my goal is to kind of clear up some of these misconceptions and give us a review of what albinism really is and what we can do about it. So a patient like this comes into the clinic. Several uh, diagnoses are possible, including oculocutaneous albinism, ocular albinism, Kodiak Higashi, uh, Hanoski Tudlak syndrome, and Vici syndrome, among others. So there are several important clinical findings that are common in almost every type of albinism. The first picture here is foveal hypoplasia. A good way to visualize this is with an OCT. You can see the top OCT is normal here, and on the bottom there's no foveal pit, and the nerve fiber layer has overgrown, is overlying the foveal. Another common finding is uh, found on a, re a retinal angiogram. You get invasion of the vasculature into the foveal in the uh, macula area. Uh, this is a transillumination technique that Josh talked about, where you can see the light, the red reflex coming off of the retina and shining right through the iris due to a lack of pigment. In this picture, you can actually see the outline of the lens, which is pretty cool. A really important finding that I think we're all familiar with here because of Dr. Creel is the abnormal decussation of the visual pathway. In pigmented individuals, you get 55, 45% crossing. In the individuals with albinism, you get upwards of 90% they cross. This can cause a lot of problems with stereo vision. And uh, a good way to visualize this and to confirm it is with a VEP. So normal individual you can see here on the right, on the left, and on the right you can see what happens with individuals with albinism. You get this reversal of the pathways. So some other important clinical features are pendular nystagmus, which is different from normal nystagmus in the fact that there's no fast and slow phase. It's just a steady kind of pendular-like movement. Strabismus, which can lead to amblyopia, photophobia, refractive errors. Uh, basically overall poor vision. There are several different types of albinism that I want to talk about today. <coughs> First is oculocutaneous albinism. There are seven main types. All of these are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. And ocular albinism, there's two main types, and these are all inherited in an X-linked recessive pattern. So OCA type 1, or oculocutaneous albinism type 1, is due to a mutation in the TYR gene. There's over 200 mutations that are known in this gene coats with tyrosinase, which is the enzyme responsible for converting tyrosine to dopa and dopa to dopapinones, which are part of the pathway in the formation of melanin. So there's two subtypes that we talk about a lot, tyrosinase positive and tyrosinase negative. Tyrosinase positive individuals have some tyrosinase activity, therefore they have some melanin and an overall better prognosis, whereas tyrosinase negative individuals have very little to no tyrosinase activity. OCA type 1 is the most common type due to a mutation in the OCA2 gene, which was formerly known as the P gene, causes dysfunctional melanosomes, uh, has less visual impairment than individuals with OCA type 1. OCA type 3 through 7, <coughs> just want to mention briefly, they're very rare, usually only occurring in certain subpopulations, and uh, worth noting, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now. Ocular albinism type 1 and 2. Uh, Type 1 is also known as Nettleship Falls ocular albinism. This is inherited in an X-linked recessive pattern, so it's mostly a disease of males. Uh, an interesting finding is the carrier mothers can have what we describe as a mud-splattered fundus. And uh, these patients usually have very poor, poor vision, and you can diagnose this by visualizing macromelanosomes on a skin biopsy. And OA type 2, again, is a very rare type, also inherited in an X-linked recessive fashion. The next type I want to talk about is Chediak Higashi syndrome. This causes intermediate severity ocular albinism. 
associated with recurrent pyogenic infections, dysfunctional lysosomes, and progressive neurologic abnormalities. Unfortunately, most of these patients don't live past childhood. And you can diagnose this by visualizing giant azerophilic granules in the granulocytes. Uh, another type that's important to recognize is hermansky pudlak syndrome. This is most commonly found in individuals of Puerto Rican but also Swiss descent. And this is associated with platelet, platelet dysfunction, bleeding disorders, interstitial lung disease, and granulomatous colitis. The last type I want to talk about today is called Vichy syndrome. Uh, this was just recently classified in January of this year. It's the only form of albinism found on chromosome 18. It's very, very rare. Has several ophthalmic findings and uh, overall systemic findings that are important. So you get bilateral cataracts, mild fundus hyperpigmentation, and bilater bilateral <coughs> optic nerve atrophy. Uh, the systemic findings include a genesis of the corpus callosum, cardiomyopathy, and immune defects. So you can get characteristic abnormal fundus seen here. You can get an abnormal OCT, and this is kind of a poor OCT, but because of the extremely poor health of these individuals, this one's had to be done with a hand unit rather than uh, the type we're used to. So you can see the lack of a foveal pit and a little bit of the overlying nerve fiber layer in there. So these individuals have very, very bad health problems. Vision is one of the least of their concerns, but it does help us with diagnosing what their syndrome is. So management of all types of these individuals, uh, there's not a ton we can do for them, but what we can do is evaluate them regularly, make sure we treat any misalignment present, try to minimize any amblyopia that could occur, maximize their visual potential with glasses and other low vision aids. Uh, obviously recommend they still wear sunscreen because skin cancer is a very real problem for these individuals and refer them to a genetic counselor. So their prognosis, they're actually very much the same as the rest of us. They can have normal lifespan, development, intelligence, fertility as individuals that aren't affected. Uh, really their biggest problem is poor vision. This is a, a family that I saw in the clinic yesterday with Dr. Hoffman. I told him I was giving this presentation and they agreed to let me show their picture. So uh, this guy here on the right, or on the left, excuse me, 15 years old, just trying to get his driver's license uh, on the basketball team, 4.0 student, and his sister, a member of the volleyball team, and they're normal, happy individuals that aren't really any different than the rest of us. So, any questions? I want to thank Dr. Creel, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, he helped me with a lot of the photos, diagrams, and a lot of the information, including the Vici syndrome. And here are my references. Thank you.